Today's topic, Chapter 9, Organizing the Body of the Speech. Early in the semester, we're going to be looking at outlining the speech. It's very foundational to everything that we need to do for the rest of the semester. So we're going to start with chapters 9, 10, and 11. And so with chapter 9, we're looking at how to organize the body of the speech. Also, we're going to look at how to select a topic. And so when we talk about organizing the body of the speech, we're really just talking about what pattern do we want to use for how to organize our points in the speech. Depending on the type of speech that you're going to be doing, it may determine or require a different organizational pattern uh, to those points that will make the speech more effective. Also with regard to selecting a topic, this is something that a lot of students have difficulty with, trying to really settle on a topic for their speech. So this will provide some ideas in terms of how to do that. All right, so we may ask ourselves, why do we need to outline our speech? or why is organization important. The reason that we outline our speeches at all is because it is the tool that we use to organize our thoughts. And when we write essays or things like this, sometimes they're in uh, sentences that just sort of flow and we have this kind of free range of ideas that starts to flow out of us, but when it comes to a speech, you want everything you say to be very well thought out. You want each thing that you say to mean something. So therefore, we need to organize this information that we're going to present. There's different reasons why we want to, to do this and why it's important. One of them is accessibility. In other words, it makes the material that you're presenting to your audience more accessible. It makes it easier for them to recall what it is that you're saying, to remember what it is that you've presented. Another reason is because of attention. When you are speaking, if you have an organized pattern, an organized method to what you're saying, it makes it easier for people to listen to your speech and follow along with you. If it's just for a minute or two, that's one thing people can follow along, but the longer you speak, the more organized your speech really needs to be. Otherwise, people begin to uh, lose track of what's going on. And the last thing is anticipation. When we talk about anticipation, we mean that when there's organization in your speech, people can see that your speech is heading somewhere, and therefore they're anticipating some sort of a special uh, ending or maybe a an application that's going to be important for them. Okay, so before we get really too involved into the outlining organizational part of it, we're going to talk a little bit about choosing your topic. As I mentioned, this is one of the most difficult things for a lot of the students to do when they start to do their speeches and they start to think about presenting speeches is finding a topic. They have a lot of difficulty settling on their topic. And so these are some things that may help you to be able to do that. The first thing is this. Find a topic that is interesting to you or that intrigues you. Something you don't have to necessarily be familiar with it. It could be something that you're just interested in that you've always wanted to know more about. It could be something that you do have already a lot of interest in and already even have gained some, some knowledge in but find something that's interesting to you. That will help to motivate you to be able to give the speech. It'll make it easier, more interesting for you as you do th go through the different steps of researching and preparing and, and giving your speech. One of the ways that you can do things that will help you is uh, to brainstorm your topic. Maybe <clears throat> you decide that you want to talk about amusement parks. And so you can brainstorm your topic. If you brainstorm your topic, or maybe you want to just talk about fun things to do in California, and 
then you brainstorm your topic and you come up with a lot of different things. Maybe you come up with go to amusement parks, go to the beach, go to the movies, go, uh, I don't know, canoeing, whatever it is that you like to do, skiing, dirt bike riding, anything at all. Then out of that list of things, you can maybe identify the topic that you would like to work on in your speech. And out of that list of things, maybe your topic that you decided on was amusement parks. And out of amusement parks, you decide that maybe you would like to talk about going to Disneyland. So you can now brainstorm Disneyland, again, as another brainstorm. And when you're brainstorming things, basically it just means that you're writing down everything that pops into your mind according to that particular uh, idea or topic. So if you're talking about fun things to do about California, you write down all the things that come to your mind. Now you've selected something, amusement parks and specifically Disneyland. Now you can write down Disneyland and start brainstorming everything that comes to your mind about Disneyland. And you can start talking about things like the rides and you can talk about the high cost of going to Disneyland and you can talk about the uh, food that you encounter at Disneyland, and you can talk about the entertainment that you see there, or the fireworks, or the music, or the parades, or the characters, or just the different kinds of lands that are there with the designs of them, all different types of things. So this is how you brainstorm your topic. Once you've done that and you've written all those things down, you want to narrow it down and so you can look at those things that you've written down and try to determine which of those things do I want to talk about, because you're not going to talk about all of them. In our speeches in our class, we're always going to have three main points. That's very important that you realize this. Always three main points for our speeches, not two, not one, not four, not five, three main points. So that means you have your topic, Disneyland, and now you're going to talk and identify, you want to identify the three main points you want to talk about in your speech. And maybe out of all the different things that you've listed, you've decided that because you want to talk about why Disneyland is a fun place to go to, you've decided that you want to talk about the rides at Disneyland, you want to talk about food at Disneyland and you want to talk about the entertainment at Disneyland. So those become your three main points. Ask yourself, is this something that's interesting? Is it something that meets the criteria of the assignment? And will my audience find it interesting as well? So how do you identify your main ideas? We have a thing called a thesis statement or a, also another one called a specific purpose statement. You'll learn a little bit more about those in a little while, but for now just know that we have them. And so when you come up with a thesis statement, a thesis statement is really kind of like your, your theory. It is your hypothesis about the topic. And so we could say in this Disneyland example that your theory or the about Disneyland is that it's a fun place to go to. So your thesis might be something like Disneyland is a, a fun way to spend the day or a specific purpose. I want to talk to you about how you can have a great time at Disneyland. So those could be your thesis or your specific purpose. And so you can see that you're talking there about having fun at Disneyland, basically, or how to have fun at an amusement park. And so that can be a way that you can identify your main ideas that can help to lead you to that. Another one is through patterns in your research. That means that for topics not like having fun at Disneyland, because most of you, I'm sure, have been to Disneyland, but maybe it's you're, you're doing a topic on maybe an informative or a persuasive speech about an issue that you're not that familiar about, and therefore you need to do some research on that particular topic. And as you do your research, you begin to see patterns that develop in your research.
and therefore you can uh, identify those things and that become maybe your main ideas of your speech. So you may see that there are three themes that keep reoccurring as you research this topic and you realize those are pretty important because I keep seeing them over and over again. So let me make those my main topics of my speech. Questions you want to ask when selecting your main ideas? Well, once you've brainstormed your ideas, you can ask, is this an, an essential idea? Can several of these ideas be combined? Or can I use this idea as support? So you may have 10 or 15 different things that you've written down on your paper, and you're not going to use all of those things as you brainstorm your topic. And you want to ask, is this an important essential idea, or is this sort of a side idea? Is this something that goes along with my theme or my, the thesis of my speech? Remember we said your thesis in this speech might be <clears throat> having um, why Disneyland is a fun way or why going to Disneyland is a fun way to spend the day. So if your thesis or your theory or the reason for giving your speech is that you want to talk about why it's fun to go to Disneyland, you may want to not include topics that do not support fun, such as Disneyland's expensive, there's a lot of long lines there, things like this. So you may want to leave those kind of topics out altogether, but then you can combine other topics because you want to maybe talk about uh, entertainment there, but in the entertainment side of things, you could make one point that encompasses entertainment, even though on your list of things you've listed on your paper, you may have parades, you may have shows, you may have characters, you may have different things like this, and that all may be part of the entertainment thing. So you may be able to combine some of those ideas. You may be able to determine whether those are supporting ideas or main ideas. There are several factors that are going to affect how you arrange your points. One of the questions you want to ask as you look at the points that you've decided to write about or the topics is, are they dependent on one another or are they independent? Because what this means is, do the points that you've, that you've listed there, are they points that can stand alone on their own? That would mean they're independent. If they're points that require um, you know, something else there, like for example, the entertainment one, uh, entertainment can stand on its own, but maybe the parades doesn't. It's dependent upon being part of it, a category of entertainment. Whereas maybe the different foods, you know, might be something that stands on its own. And so you want to determine that. How do you connect these things is what you're really getting at there. And how do you organize them? There are things in, in that we want to consider as we do our speeches. And those are things called the primacy and recency effect. The primacy effect, primacy refers to the first thing that you hear. So as people, we've heard the expression that we like to make a good first impression because that's a lasting thing. And so in speeches, it's the same. This means that when you're doing an attention getter, which is something you do at the very beginning of your speech, people are likely to remember the first thing they hear in, their, in your speech. That's the primacy effect. And also the last thing that they hear in your speech. That's the recency effect. So this is one reason why your introduction section of your speech and your conclusion section of your speech are going to be very, very important. And you want to put a lot of thought into those because they may not remember all the stuff in between, but they will remember those things. So now we're going to be looking at the patterns for arranging the ideas of your speech. So you see here on the right hand side of this slide you have a picture of a hamburger something like that. So some of you maybe have certain ways you like to arrange things. You've got your lettuce on top and then your tomato and then your burger. Maybe you throw some cheese or some onion or whatever you put in there. 
So you have a certain order, a way of arranging things. Speeches are like that. So there's different patterns that you can do. Just like there's different patterns of ways that you can arrange your hamburger, depending maybe on where you get your burger. If you get a Big Mac, it's arranged a certain way. If you get an in and out double-double, it might be arranged a little differently. And so these patterns are listed here, chronological, spatial, categorical or topical, cause effect, problem solution, comparison, contrast, and residues. And so when we talk about chronological pattern, really all we're talking about here is something that goes in order from step to step. If you're doing something that has a process that requires a specific order, then we would call that a chronological pattern. So a recipe, for example, is a chronological pattern because there are certain steps you need to follow. If you get a table from Ikea and you need to put it together, there are certain things you need to do first, then second, then third. So some speeches require chronological patterns. Another type of pattern you may want to do in organizing your points is what we call a spatial pattern. Spatial pattern has to do with how things occupy space. So maybe you want to talk about, I don't know, the political views of America. And maybe you want to look at it uh, in this particular way. Political views along the east, the east coast of America, political views in the central part of America, political views on the west coast of America. So you're looking at space there. Maybe you want to talk about our campus at school. and You want to talk about the north part of campus, the central part of campus, the southern part of the campus, and how things are arranged and what things are there. Or maybe in a building, the first floor, the second floor, the third floor. Those would all be examples of spatial organization. So some spa speeches may work good with that type of pattern. Categorical, also called topical, we usually just refer to it as topical. It means that each point in your speech is its own topic and stands on its own. So that means if we go back to our example of our Disneyland speech, and you want to talk about the fun things to do at Disneyland, and you have your topics of entertainment, and you have another topic of rides, and you have another topic of food, you can put those points in any order you want. There's no reason why you need to put food first or second or, or last. You can put it wherever you want it. Whereas with the chronological pattern or maybe with the spatial pattern, it may make more sense to organize, organize it in a specific way. Topical, each topic stands on its own. It's its own unique little uh, unit. Cause and effect. <clears throat> as you can probably tell, is there's a cause for something, and this is the effect of it. So this usually is a good pattern for an informative speech, a lot of times, where you're laying out cause and effects of different kinds of things. Could also work with a persuasive speech. Problem solution, here you outline a problem, and then you tell what the solution is. This works good with a persuasive speech, a lot of times, if you're trying to propose a particular solution that you've identified and persuade somebody or some group that that's a good solution. But if you make it problem solutions, make it plural, now you're looking at a problem and now you're examining several different solutions, possibilities of ways to deal with it. Now you've changed it into an informative speech because you're not promoting any particular solution, but giving information or informing or educating about possible solutions. Comparison and contrast. This would be also sometimes known as comparison or comparative advantages. Here is what you're doing is you're looking at a situation where everybody agrees that something needs to be done, like maybe you need to go with your group of friends and go eat dinner somewhere on your way to do some other activity. But everybody has a different idea of where to go eat. And so therefore you want to compare the advantages of going to one person's suggest, suggested place versus another person. 
So one person, you know, picks one restaurant, another one picks another, another picks another. And so you look at all the different criteria there and you're able to make your decision based on comparing the advantages. So maybe one has a certain price point that's important. Maybe one has certain items on a menu that's important. Maybe one has, uh, you know, takes longer or is quicker than another place to eat at. Maybe another one is on the way to where you're going. So you throw all those different things into consideration <clears throat> and compare and contrast them and decide which one's going to be the best. Residues. Oh, by the way, the comparison contrast is also what you might do if you're looking on Amazon for a product and you're trying to decide between four or five or ten different items and you're looking at the features of them and deciding which one's best. All things considered, price, etc., etc., you come up with your advantage there and you pick your make your pick. Residues has to do with uh, eliminating things. So you can't do this one because you know, it costs a lot of money. This one's not convenient because it only happens on Tuesdays and Thursdays. This one's not convenient because, you know, it's limited to five people. Therefore, we're going to do this choice that remains. And so by process of elimination, you come up with your choice. So now we have a checklist of things here. This is basically the same information that I just gave you. If you want to look that over, you can, and uh, you can pause the, the tape here and just look at it if you want to get a little more information here. Now that we've looked at some of the organizational patterns, let's look at the speech outline itself. This first section that you're looking at is not actually part of the speech as far as what you're going to say, but it is part of the outline. It is the first thing that you see on an outline. There is a, t a thing in your in Canvas and under the Files tab, which is called Outline Guide. If you open that, you should pause this recording for a moment and open that. And when you open that, you will find about a 50 or 60 page document that has a lot of details about all the different speeches you're going to be doing, instructions, examples of different types of outlines, some other types of helps in there for citations, all kinds of things. And so you want to look at that. And if you look at that, you're going to see that at the top of those outlines, there is this section that looks like this that consists of a title and it consists of these four elements, topic, general purpose, specific purpose, central idea. This section, for lack of a better name, I will just call and refer to it as sort of an abstract section. It is like a section or an abstract rather that you would find if you go to the library and you look in a, a database or something and you see an article that looks interesting to you and you can kind of read a little blurb about what that article's about without having to read the whole outline. That's what this is. This is telling the reader of your outline, of your written outline, <clears throat> exactly what you're going to be doing in this speech. So the topic on this particular speech, this is from a former student, is Alexander the Great. The general purpose is to commemorate. For general purpose, it's always going to be two words depending on the type of speech you're doing. And so the general purpose will be to commemorate, to inform, to persuade for our speeches. That topic is always going to be sort of a short thing. You don't want a big sentence there. You just want two, three words. So Alexander the Great or whatever it might be, immigration, policy, something like that would be up there. General purpose, to commemorate, to inform, to persuade. Specific purpose, now you're going to expand a little bit about what you're going to commemorate on. So you're going to commemorate, but specifically what? In this case, to commemorate the life and legacy of Alexander the Great to the world. So that's what you're really going to be talking about. The central idea is what outlines or lays out your three main points. So you can see here 
It says, today I will first show how Alexander the Great accomplished so much with his leadership style. Secondly, I will discuss the legacy he left in his lifetime. And lastly, I will talk about how Alexander the Great inspires me in my life. So those are going to be the three main points that you're going to talk about in your speech, and they're going to be in the same order that you're going to be talking about them. You don't want to change this once you set this, so you want to think it through and put it in there. So this little section is what we call the abstract. As I said, it goes at the top of your outline page. And if you are referring to one of those examples in the outline guide, you will see that all of the speeches have one of these little sections at the top. This next section that we look at is where your speech actually begins. This is called the introduction section. Your speeches are divided into three main parts. The first part is called the introduction section. Then where you have your three main points, that's called the body. And then after the body section, we have what is called the conclusion. So those are your three main parts of your speech, introduction, body, conclusion. And so in this introduction section, this is what we're looking at right here. In this introduction section, the first thing you have is an attention getter. And you want to write this out completely as to how you would like to say it. It's not something that you want to just put a little note here. In this outline, by the way, everything is written out in full sentences. You don't use keywords, you don't use little hints, you don't use ideas that are going to just spur your memory. This is something that's written out completely to the point where if somebody else had to give your speech, they could take your outline and read it to the, to the audience and it would make perfect sense to your audience. So if you just put in here, tell about the time I fell off my bicycle at five years old, a, a stranger or somebody that didn't have that experience wouldn't be able to tell that. So your attention getter, whatever it's going to be, write it out. Some people kind of take shortcuts with that because you don't want it to be too long. And if you just put a little blurb like that in there, you start to embellish it more and more and more, and it gets longer and longer. The main thesis, this section is probably the most difficult section, one of the most difficult sections anyway, for those that are writing outlines to produce because they don't really understand what the thesis is. The thesis is like like your hypothesis or your theory about this speech. What is it that you believe? In this case, what do you believe about Alexander the Great that makes you want to write this speech? So you're making a statement about Alexander the Great. In this case, Alexander the Great brought his vision, wisdom, and confidence into the world and did some of the greatest achievements in only 13 years of his life. So now you're going to prove that in your speech. If that's what you believe about Alexander the Great, then that's what you're going to try to convince your audience of in your speech. <clears throat> Establishing credibility. If you're doing a speech that requires research, like on a commemorative speech, an informative speech, a persuasive speech, then you're going to need to establish credibility. Here you're trying to let your audience know what it is that you have done to educate yourself on this topic. What is it that makes you worth listening to? And what is it that's going to give your audience some confidence that you actually have something credible to say about this topic, that you actually know something more about it than maybe they do themselves without having done any research? So this is what gives you credibility. There's different types of credibility. We can talk about that later. But for now, <clears throat> just know that you want to establish credibility. In the speeches, in your in informative, persuasive speeches, also in your commemorative speech, if you're doing that one, you, you must establish credibility. If you're doing your first speech, which is your personal experience, uh, turning point, cultural narrative type speech, that one you do not need to establish credibility because it's about you and who knows about you better than you. So you don't need to qualify and let the audience know why you're qualified to speak about yourself. 
but other topics you do. That's what this is. And so if you're doing that first outline, this section will be missing, but the other outlines, yeah, this is going to be part of it. And then we have our preview statement. The preview statement is identical to the central idea that we identified in the abstract section. It just has a different name, preview or central idea, to help distinguish one from the other. But it's identical. You can cut and paste them one into the other and they're going to be identical. So it's just going to say, again, what your three main points are in the order in which you're going to be giving them. Now, just a little note here. The book refers to the thesis as central idea. We just call the thesis the main thesis. But in the book, the author refers to this as central idea. We refer to central idea and preview as being basically the same thing. They're preview statements of your particular speech. So hopefully that's not too confusing for you, but run it back and listen to this again if you need to. In your speech, you have what's called the general purpose. So as I mentioned before, the general purpose is going to always be just two words, at least in our outlines, because we're only going to use one of these top three types, to inform, to persuade, to commemorate. So where you have general purpose, and by the way, you want to follow those models uh, in your outline guide, that example, pay attention to how things are spaced out in there, where it says topic, where it says um, general purpose, specific purpose, central idea. Pay attention to all of that, how it's spaced out, what's in bold, what's not. Pay attention to the margins, the indentations, and copy those things as well as you can. Same with the introduction, same with the body and the conclusion. If you can follow those examples exactly, then you will have a really well formatted speech. And so uh, then it just matters do you have something credible to say, but that will be in the right form. And so a lot of times people, when they get to the general purpose, they make a sentence out of this. It should be only two words. For your personal experience speech or turning point speech, it'll be to inform. Why? Because you're informing about yourself. For your persuasive speech, to persuade. For your commemorative speech, to commemorate. Don't worry about this last one because that's not really going to apply to what we're doing in class. Next, we have our specific purpose statement. And in the specific purpose statement, remember, we're going to expand now on what it is that you're going to do. So if it's an informative, what do you want to inform about? What do you want them to learn, do, consider, agree with, or persuade about, and so forth? It is an action statement, as it says here, encompassing the topic and general purpose of your speech. So your topic is... And the other one, Alexander the Great, and your purpose is to commemorate. So that means you're going to commemorate the life and legacy of Alexander the Great. That's what you're doing specifically. You're not going to just say, I'm going to talk about Alexander the Great. That's a little bit too vague and too broad. You need to narrow it down. So the purpose of the specific purpose statement is to narrow down whatever it is you're going to do and kind of put it into a more precise and concise channel so that you've narrowed down your topic and given it more direction. In an informative speech, if you're going to do an informative speech, your general purpose would be to inform. Your specific purpose would be something more specific in this case, to explain or to inform how pretzels are made. So the specific purpose, you cannot just say in the specific purpose to inform about pretzels. To inform about pretzels is too broad, is too vague. You want it to be more narrow than that because you could, if you want to tell us about pretzels, there's a lot of different things that you could talk about. You could talk about how pretzels are made 
but you could also maybe talk about the history of pretzels, different types of pretzels, the ingredients of pretzels, the nutritional value of pretzels, uh, which pretzel company makes the best, best pretzels, is it uh, Antiums or Wetzels, pretzels, and so these are all different things. So you want to narrow it down so your audience knows what lane you're going to be in here with regard to pretzels. It also helps you to guide your research. So if you know that you're going to be specifically talking about how pretzels are made, now you can leave out all or most of that other kind of stuff. You don't need to talk about Wetzels and Auntie M's pretzels. You may not need to talk at all or mention anything about the nutritional value or the different shapes or types of pretzels necessarily. You can talk about you know, how the pretzels are going to be made, the procedure, and so forth. If we're doing a persuasive speech, now we're going to have our general purpose is to persuade. But what are we going to persuade about? We need to narrow that down. So we could say we're going to persuade you to what? To endorse the president's economic plan regarding DACA. If you just say to endorse the president's economic plan, that's kind of specific, but the economic plan involves a lot of different aspects. So you want to identify, if you can, something a little more specific regarding DACA. Because the economic plan would include maybe this DACA stuff, immigration, it might include uh, social kind of uh, help for aid and things like this. It might include many different things, NASA, uh, I don't know, different kind of research for different things, military. So maybe you don't want to talk about all those other things. You want to talk specifically about DACA or immigration or something. So tell us which part of this plan you're going to talk about. Again, that helps you with your research and that helps your audience to know what you're going to be discussing. So what is a thesis statement? As I mentioned, this is one of the most difficult things for students to really grasp and understand. And is one of the things that they make I would say about 80 to 90 percent of students do not put down a correct thesis statement on their outlines. So let's hope you, you all can be a group that will not have that problem. So what is a thesis statement? Here's just some different ways of thinking about it. They all pretty much say the same thing. They just say it a little differently. A statement of what you believe about the topic and what you will try to prove in your speech. The thesis statement, as I say, is kind of like your hypothesis. A hypothesis is what you think will happen in a given situation. Some call it an educated guess or whatever. But you have a theory about what will happen if you mix chemical A and chemical B together. Your hypothesis or your theory is that this reaction will happen. And so you have a belief about it. And that's really what you're doing here in your speech. What is it you believe about this topic that you're trying to prove in your speech? Another way of looking at it is that it conveys the core proposition about your topic. Maybe there's a core element that you uh, can identify with regard to your topic. It is the reason you are giving the speech in the first place. You believe something. If you go back to the pretzel girl of the slide before, or a couple slides back, why is the pretzel girl giving this speech about how to make pretzels? She believes something about pretzels, doesn't she? She, she has some kind of theory about pretzels. Her theory might be that pretzels are snacks that you can easily make at home. That might be her theory, her thesis. Pretzels are snacks that you can easily make at home. That could be her thesis. That's the reason she's going to tell you about this topic. Her specific purpose is, today I'm going to inform you about how to make pretzels. 
her thesis is, I believe that pretzels are snacks that are easy to make at home. Do you see the difference there? It is what motivates you to give the speech in the, in the first place. There's something you believe, there's something behind this particular topic that is compelling you to give a speech about this topic. That's really what you're trying to get at in your thesis. Here are some examples that may help you to dis differentiate between the specific purpose, the thesis, and the central idea preview. Okay, in this particular example, the specific purpose is to inform about the character building skills that are acquired and shaped through parenting. So the speech is an informative speech, general purpose to inform. What are you gonna inform about? Specific purpose to inform about character building skills that are acquired through parenting. Now, what do you believe about this? What is your thesis? You have a theory about this topic and you believe that being a parent is rewarding. Why? Because it develops character. That's your theory. So this is the reason why you're giving the speech. This is what you're going to be talking about, but this is why you're giving the speech. This is what you believe about it. That's your thesis. Now you go down here to the central idea and preview, and this becomes your three main points. This is how you're going to break this topic down in the body of your speech so that you can educate us about this and tell us what you think about it. So you have here, being a parent can give definition to one's character by first, that's called a signpost, building skills of patience. Second, that's a signpost, selflessness. And finally, that's a signpost, humility. So here are your three main points laid out in the order in which you want to talk about them. And so this is <clears throat> your roadmap of how you're going to inform us about this and how you're going to prove your thesis to us or your theory. Now, <clears throat> one of the things you need to think about a little bit is once you figure out what your points are gonna be and so forth is how you're going to support those points. So you're not going to just say that you know, character building, you know, comes through selflessness or something, you're going to give some evidence of that. So you want to think about how much evidence do you need to support your main point number one, your main point number two, and your main point number three. So for each of your main points, you want to ask these questions. How much extra information do I need to support it? What kind of information do I need to support it? and what criteria am I looking for? So basically is what you're doing here is you're saying, okay, it's not enough just to say that Disneyland is a great place to go for the day. I need to convince people of that and I'm going to be telling them about the different types of things. Like for example, I'm going to tell them that Disneyland is a fun place to go because of the rides. Well, how much information do you need to do incorporate into your speech to convince them that the rides are fun. What kind of information? You may want to give some examples, you may want to give some personal testimony, you may want to give some pictures of things, you may want to do some research on the different kind of rides, how fast they go and different things like this. And so this is what we're, what we're trying to figure out here with regard to how to support our points.